successfully unmuted myself. Well, good evening, everybody. Um, this is an awful subject to try and talk about. Um, I'll probably only speak for about 35, 40 minutes max. You know what academics are like. And uh, Mill did say that we agreed that he would stop me if I went much beyond that. Um, what I like to try and do is just try and look back and see how we've got to here, um, why it has happened, what has happened, where we are two weeks into this war, uh, what might happen next, uh, and what might be the sort of best outcome, outcome we could look for. Um, I won't go into any detail in any one area because there's an awful lot to cover. And I recognize that for, for many people, it's a very difficult subject. I should say in fairness to my colleagues at Bradford that in the Peace Studies Department, most of the staff over the years have been involved in things like, um, well, conflict resolution, mediation, peace building, gender and violence, and a whole range of issues like that. There've always been one or two of us who looked sort of more at the, at the hard end, uh, toys for the boys, if you will, but the reality is we try to understand how all start, how they're conducted even, and how they might be into an or brought to an early end. So to the extent we're just sort of one part of a, of a department where most of the work is, as bluntly, very much more positive. Um, Mill mentioned that I actually have taught at defence colleges, which are really an oddity. I got asked to speak at the Royal Air Force Staff College back in 1982, so it's about the 40th year, yes. <clears throat> and that was basically to present the unilateral case for nuclear disarmament. I think there's a bit of window dressing involved. But it's worthwhile. I, I did that for a number of years. But at the end of the Cold War, I thought, well, you know, it re isn't quite so important, hopefully. But they're interested in sort of wider views because a lot of the work in peace studies had assumed that there were much wider conflict problems in the world. And so I carried on doing it, and I still do it occasionally. In fact, right up until a year or so ago with the lockdown, I may well go back to it. It's an extraordinary opportunity just to talk to people who will always debate with you. I would always say that of any military audience, but that's just by way of explanation. Um, what I want to try and do, as I said, is look at how we got here. And I suppose that the obvious place to start is where did Putin come from? And I think this is very important in some ways. I should say that virtually everything that I touch on will be contested by somebody. And it's inevitable with this sort of subject. So what I'm trying to do, I suppose, is to throw particular bits of light on a, a very complex subject. Even to call it a subject is bad because, I mean, there's so much suffering going on now because of what is happening. As far as Putin is concerned, I think you've got to go back to the late 1980s and the very sudden collapse of the old Soviet bloc, uh, particularly in 1989 and 1990, the end of the Berlin Wall, for example. And it's worth remembering, some people will know this, that the end of the Soviet bloc was partly a very strong exercise in civilian resistance, particularly in many Eastern European countries. It's an aspect that we forget uh, because it was ordinary people, starting with Solidarność, Solidarity, the trade union in Poland in the early 1980s. It's an important part of it, but the collapse was very, very quick. And in essence, by 19, well, late 1990, certainly into 1991, the whole Soviet Union had more or less come apart at the seams. And uh, basically Gorbachev, who had in many ways been responsible for it and may well go down in history as quite a remarkable person in his own right, because he more or less brought the Cold War to an end, if very chaotically. And he was replaced by Yeltsin, who I think was one of the world's most famous uh, alcoholic presidents that we've seen in virtually any country. Um, the, the collapse was extraordinary. And almost immediately you had what some people called the turbo capitalism system or hyper capitalism coming in uh, and Russia sort of embraced this. It's when the, the theft of large parts of uh, the Russian infrastructure uh, was really gobbled up by a relatively few people. Uh, and that has persisted in many ways through to the present time. Um, the, the shock was extraordinary. I mean, in the 1990s, uh, one point, a third of all the people in Russia were below the poverty line, and life expectancy fell by many years for men in particular, and alcoholism was absolutely rife, and it took the best part of 10 years for Russia to climb out of that to some extent, 
Uh, and in that time, there was a huge concentration of wealth in relatively few hands. Out of that mess came a group of KGP people who had many of the sort of eyes on power. And one of them, of course, was Vladimir Putin. And he came to power right at the end of the 1990s and remains in power in different ways now. So essentially, that's how it came about. But the real point is that within the Russian generations of that time, there is still an utter bitterness of the way they think that uh, Russia was treated with contempt by the West of the world, the absolute losers. And that is still there, particularly among older people, less so among the younger generation. And that is something which Putin has been incredibly care clever at using in his own running of the country. And progressively over the last 20 years, he's been able to achieve what is really a, a kind of an autocracy uh, but aided by a relatively narrow coterie of people. You know, the Minister of Defence, Sergei Shuigi, uh, Valery Gerasimov, the Chief of General Staff, the Secretary of the Security Council, the FSB Director, the sort of domestic st uh, spy directors, and the Director of Foreign Intelligence. In fact, those five people form a kind of inner circle and are very closely knit and back Putin more or less to the hilt. But the reality about that perception of of uh, Russia changing so quickly is still there. I mean, look at it this way. Britain got out of empire bit by bit over about 40 years, starting with the partition of India. 40 years after the end of empire in the early 80s, we still not got over it. For Russia, they lost their empire, which would consider an empire in 40, 50 weeks. And it's hardly surprising the impact was so huge. But we're now where we are and essentially in the last eight or 10 years in particular, Putin has really developed this idea of restoring Russia to its historic greatness. In fact, almost like a Tsarist empire. And essentially that is really the crux of where he is now. You could say that it is sort of to some extent ideological. I'm not sure really about that, but certainly is absolutely determined to do this. And I think the main element behind this is the slow, steady expansion of NATO eastwards and the expansion of the uh, coming together of more EU states, particularly the ones in Eastern Europe. Back in the Soviet times, and I, I visited Moscow several times during the Cold War years, Russians, well, so, Russians, yes, Russians used to talk about the Russian near abroad. Those countries which were actually beyond even uh, Belarus and Ukraine, which they saw as being in Russia's sphere of influence. Now that sphere of influence didn't just go, it very largely disappeared. And the end result was a circumstance which Putin was not prepared to accept. Now that's the overall background. There isn't time to look at precisely where Ukraine came in at this, but essentially he had certain demands which he made very clear in lectures what towards the end of last year. And essentially it was to push NATO back and to make sure that Russia had sort of a buffer states, uh, which would ensure they could develop rapidly and possibly even take on new territories. That was an implication of what he said. And I think what he really wanted to see from this war against Ukraine was to establish two big buffer states to the West. One already essentially under his control, Belarus, small population, pretty large area, but the key one was Ukraine with over 40 million people and one of the breadbaskets of the world. And if you had those two states under Kremlin control, um, almost certainly with forward-based nuclear weapons, then that would be the basis for building, making Russia great again. And that I think was pretty clear cut. So obviously that's what he wanted to do. What were the precise war aims? Well, obviously take full control of the broad Donbass region part of which was already essentially in Russian hands with the separatists, and also really to collapse the regime and ensure that there was a, a replacement regime, if you like a puppet regime in Kyiv. And that essentially was where I think uh, the war plan came from. The military plan was fairly straightforward. And essentially um, it, it looked at the, the business of actually taking Ukraine's capital, Kyiv, very quickly, uh, taking more control of southern Ukraine, particularly all the Black Sea coast, and connecting the area from Crimea through to the northeast to the Donbass region. So there will be a full 
if you like, a side of not just a corridor, a sort of a belt of Russian control, or at least controlled by the new regime. that did not seem to be an idea of occupying the whole country. And essentially, that I think was one of the keys to what has, from a Russian point of view, has gone terribly wrong. Now, obviously, when the war started a fortnight ago, a matter of a few hours from now, um, it did look like that was a pretty clear plan. Although there were attacks in many parts uh, of uh, Ukraine, mainly on the air defense facilities and all the rest and uh, army stores and the like. But it became pretty clear within about three days that the attack was actually failing in its key aim. And the key aim was basically to take the capital quickly, starting with a major assault, assault on Kiev International Airport. That failed. And essentially by Sunday, it was very clear that three days in um, that Putin himself was very angry uh, about the failure because it was not going according to plan. It was already starting to use a, the military type term, getting bogged down. Now, why was this? I think it's just worth looking at in a, a little bit of detail. There was actually an article published in one of the Western military journals about 10 days earlier. It was by a, 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 an able analyst called Tim Ripley, and he was basically looking at precisely what the Russians had moved in close to the border of Ukraine. And he said essentially what they had available was to complete that aim, but no more. In other words, to be able to take um, Kyiv, probably, but certainly to be able to expand the Donbass region. But he said if you wanted to actually take over Ukraine and face opposition, throughout, then Russia should have gone for a full mobilization and have been able to occupy the country and more or less garrison it. And the thing is that from Putin's perspective, there was not this belief that they will be opposed. And that I think is the fundamental thing. And so if they weren't going to be seriously opposed and people would sort of come up and welcome them with flowers, then there would be no major problem. So much so that many of the military personnel who were put in in the initial phase weren't actually military. They were actually uh, specialist police concerned with things like public order control and riot control uh, in, by their thousands. So they weren't actually trained to face up to a very determined uh, resistance led by the Ukraine army, most of whom had actually been fighting uh, sometime or other in the Donbass region over the previous five years. And that seems to be the huge error that they, they hit. I don't want to go into the military detail. I mean, it becomes choice for the boys, I know. But there's one other element, and that is that um, it is said, people who do actually study the history of land warfare in Eurasia say there's one basic problem. You never actually try to take somebody else's territory in spring or autumn, which is the time of mud. It's as simple as that. This is why you know, during the Second World War, Stalin used to talk about General Frost. The real aid to the Soviet army was everything frozen. And it looks that was a terrible mistake made on the, uh, on the side of the Russian army. So basically, three days in, Putin's, almost his whole policy was under threat. And it was pretty clear that essentially you did not have the, his army with the ability to do what was intended. I should just point out one thing here. I know, again, this is on the military side, but it is actually important. Um, in the Russian system, while you have a pretty se sizable set of armed forces, the actual active army at any one time is very big. It's about 400,000 people. And that compares with sort of the British army, which is only a fifth of that size. It's less than the American army, but the real difference is with the American army, and for the ma that matter, the British army, they're volunteer armies. They are not conscripts. In the case of Russia, if you take the whole of the armed forces, at any one time, about 40% of them are conscripts. And they only are conscripts for a year. So they're not especially well-trained, and they're also young, most of them aged 19 or 20, some even 18. And I'll come back to that later because it's important in terms of where we may go from here. Now, that is the armed forces as a whole. In the case of the army, it's an even higher proportion. And it's probable that something like half of all the troops in 
Ukraine at present, about 180,000 of them are actually young conscripts with no experience of, of actual conflict and also under the impression that they were not even going to war. And this is one of the many reasons why the army itself has a very major morale problem. So we're dealing almost from the start with what you, what you might call sort of personal issues. Um, what has happened therefore in the last week, 10 days, is a slow attempt to move to a different form of warfare, which is basically, well, to be blunt, it's much more terror driven. And it is aiming at civilian populations and urban centers in the hope that the capacity of the Ukraines to resist what Putin is trying to do uh, is undermined. Um, we're in the fairly early stages of that. That itself is proving difficult for the Russians because they don't have the exactly the kind of thing that you need to do that because they weren't planning for it. They had to bring it in, which is why things seem to be rather slow now. But it is also true that the Ukraine army itself with lots of support from the civilian population, both military and non-military, um, is offering extraordinary opposition. And that is proving very difficult for the Russians. I do not think that that in any way will stop them. I wish it would. And we're now, what, 14 days into the war, and the Russian Air Force still does not have aerial supremacy. It doesn't even have, have aerial su superiority. And it's actually finding problems with the um, Turkish made drones that Ukraine is flying and many other things. Also, and this is a horrible thing to say when this is under the aegis of peace news, is that armaments are flooding into Russia from the West, uh, mainly uh, essentially short, short range things, anti-tank missiles, anti-aircraft missiles, but they're going in in very large numbers. In one American report reckoned there were already uh, 17,000 anti-tank guided missiles delivered already with many more to go, which means that essentially uh, the terrible thing is that Russia probably cannot win this war. Um, Ukraine cannot lose it in the sense that there will be the resistance. Yet at the moment, there seems to be no prospect of any direct way out. I'm sorry it's so blunt, but I, I, it's probably best to say that and we can explore this as much as we like in discussion. But there are more things to talk about, I'm afraid. One, obviously, is that the Western policy, led largely by the United States, has been really twofold, not to go to war directly with any Russian arms group, uh, whether it's the army, the air force, or even the navy. And the major reason for that, of course, is this threat given by Putin uh, that if there was that kind of engagement, then there would be the risk, he didn't use the term precisely, risk to the use of tactical nuclear weapons. And essentially that is something which is affecting the NATO thinking a great deal. It's a new thing that they've never had to face. Therefore, sanctions have become very important. And in fact, the degree of sanctioning that is going on is, is certainly unprecedented for the country the size of Russia, and has come as a real shock, I think, uh, particularly to the head of the Russian Central Bank. Now, while Russia is in a position uh, to resist sanctions for quite a long time, it is going to be decreasingly easy to do so. Uh, Russia was prepared for this. It has lots of oil and gas to sell. It would build up foreign exchange reserves, in fact, reserves generally, of about 600 billion but most of those are actually held in banks overseas and, uh, and the central bank can't get at them. So in fact, the sanctioned issue is really a very major one. We perhaps have to face up the fact, those of you who are sort of familiar with peace studies will know um, that essentially there is a term used which is called structural violence. There are different forms of violence and some come not through direct violence, but through indirect, more structural violence. And in a sense, the use of sanctions, particularly this level, is a form of structural violence. Now, you might say that it is legitimate in a case like this. It is fundamentally not concerned with physical violence. But on the other hand, psychologically, the other side, it is seen as a violent attempt against you. And that is probably one of the things which is motivating uh, Putin to ensure that Russia goes for much more 
severe action in its determination to win in Ukraine. And that I think is going to be something which will unfold in the near future. There's another aspect here, which I think has to be pointed out. Um, you know, people of my generation who can remember the Cold War all too vividly, had this picture in our minds of this huge Soviet empire. And one assumes that Russia is like that. Geographically it is, and it is a superpower in one respect and one respect only. And that of course in its nuclear arsenals. In every other respect, it is not. I mean, if you look at the total GDP type wealth of Russia, it is less than that of, far less than that of Germany, less than that of Britain or France, less than that of even Italy or Spain. And it's, I think it's about an eighth of the GDP of China and essentially probably about a 12th of the GDP of the United States. In the whole list of how wealthy countries are, uh, Russia comes in at number 12. It's also surprising to know it's not even the second biggest arms spender after the United States. It comes in fifth after China, India, and interestingly, Britain, but you wouldn't know that from what we're told. So essentially, it is not a major economic power. It has capacities, particularly with its uh, oil and gas reserves, but it is not major, which means essentially uh, what is extremely important for Russia is to have at least one major, very powerful ally. And it does feel that it has that in the person of President Xi of China. And essentially, China is really a far more important state than most people realize in this. Xi did make it clear that he would back, basically, Putin. And I think the thing is that the way that Chinese security thinking has been going in recent years is that clearly the United States, in spite of all its problems in Afghanistan and elsewhere, still sees itself as the world's superpower and even looks down pretty strongly on the EU. And as far as China is concerned, if you have a China itself, good enough, but if you have it as a sort of part of a Eurasian bloc with uh, Russia, then essentially that is combined, certainly a superpower level of what you're talking about. Now, of course, Russia may be very small economically compared with China, but in other respects, it is a major asset to China. And much will depend, I fear, over the next few months, hopefully maybe it's only a few weeks, in what role China plays. The early signs are that China is getting very concerned about the way this is going. Um, and, and the evidence is odd. I mean, for a start, China has very close, had very close relations with Ukraine not just in grain imports, but many other things. It had quite a sizable diplomatic presence, a fairly large commercial presence. These people were not told that there was going to be a major uh, invasion by the Russians, because it appears that Beijing did not know the full extent to which Putin was pre prepared to go. And it had to scramble to get many of its people actually out of, uh, out of Ukraine. And that has left a bad feeling in Beijing and certainly, I don't read Chinese, but getting information from academics who do, they say this is even coming out in some of the domestic literature. So Putin may have an added problem there. So where we are now, I've been going on for 25 minutes, so I don't want to do much more. Um, what is likely to happen? Let, let's, let's be honest about this. Um, it is possible, just possible, that the impact of what has gone wrong from Putin's side might finally get through. Maybe not directly to him, but maybe through some of the people who are much closer to him. And essentially, if that is the case, uh, then there could be a change. There's some small indications that at least there are talks still happening, but I really wouldn't push it. It doesn't look likely at the moment. That could change in the future. I'm bound to say, if there are changes and Putin begins to, begins to sort of recognize that he can't achieve his aims, that would be mainly through changes in Russian, in Chinese attitudes, then that may mean there's a significant change. But that will depend in part on what is happening in Russia itself. Um, now, talking to people in Russia, both in Russia and people in Britain who are Russian, uh, 
Um, it's very difficult to get a clear picture. From what I can judge, and you may have your own, I'm sure many of you will have your own information, your own views. Putin has very strong control of the state media. And it's very clear that the closing down of some of the independent stations last Saturday um, was really because there was a huge concern about what they were saying. Um, one or two of those stations did actually, although they were mainly in Russian, they did actually have English language versions. And looking at those in recent days, they were astoundingly critical of, of Putin and reporting to people what was really going on. Essentially, I think some of them are still operating, but only on the international web, not within Russia. But the point is, there was an independent media, very small, which was still operating in Russia. Um, the regime, the Kremlin itself, has had to come down very strongly on dissent. They had the new rule brought in about uh, the risk of up to 15 years in jail. There'd been, I think at the last count, nearly 14,000 people arrested in the last uh, seven, the last two weeks uh, for demonstrations. And they're still persisting in spite of the fact that people are being treated extremely roughly. So what I'm saying is that the, the, it is not all as solid as you might think, but there's some other aspects to this as well. One is that although the social media has been largely closed down, you can't close it completely. And also we have, I think something like 3 million people in Russia who are actually Ukraine. And of course they, most of them, if not all of them, will have family across the border in Ukraine. And they will be in touch with family members. Now it is true there have been reports that some of the family in Ukraine are finding that their uh, relatives in Russia are being uh, basically tied in, uh, sucked in to the overall um, propaganda and are not buying the idea of what is really happening. But that is only partial. And bit by bit, unless you close down all ordinary telephone connections, then essentially news will slowly get through. Now, obviously I know people, many people are communicating by WhatsApp and other means, but these can be closed as well. So in other words, it's going to be more difficult for Putin to actually control the narrative in the way that he has done so far. And he's obviously getting fairly desperate in trying to do that at the present time. But that's, that's a, a way in which his own position might be undermined. But we do have to remember that his own career and what he plans and what those people around him plan will come apart at the seams if he's not able to achieve his aims in Ukraine itself. So we don't know what's going to happen, but there are signs here that it may become more problematic for Putin. But I wish I could say that that is likely, it is not at the present time. They're just let me just end with three or four points, uh, one of which I think will be uncomfortable. In fact, I'll start with that one, if I mean, if I may. Uh, and, you know, I, I hope, well, again, I think it has to be said. Um, the Russian military, the officers are using very tough measures, basically attacking cities. This is something that uh, Russia did very much in particularly the, the Second Chechen War in the late 1990s. It was a practice in um, Syria, uh, particularly the siege of Aleppo. It is a feature of war generally in different circumstances. And I could identify quite easily examples where in fact Western states have been involved in that. Uh, probably the most recent example where there was Western involvement would have been um, the almost saturation bombing and artillery firing of Western Mosul at the end of uh, Operation Inherent Resolve, the air war, the very intense air war against uh, ISIS between 2014 and 2018. Um, after the assault by American and French artillery and American and quite probably British bombers and the rest, and also the militias from U Iraq, particularly the Iranian-backed militias, uh, the few journalists of any kind, all Iraqi, who were able to go to Western Mosul afterwards said it was like Stalingrad. So this can happen in any form of warfare. Uh, nobody really knows how many people were killed in Western Mosul, but it was several thousand for sure. And it's worth also saying that you, you look at the latest information from the war project at the Watson Institute at Brown University, they've just brought out their new report. They basically reckon 
that the war on terror overall, including, if you will, uh, what has happened in Somalia and Yemen and the Sahel, has cost about 900,000 lives in the last 20 years. And the expenditure, if you're interested in that, is now something like $8 trillion. So we're dealing with warfare on a huge scale. That if you take that war against ISIS, fought almost entirely remotely by standoff weapons, cruise missiles, drones and the rest, that was hardly reported in the West. So while what the Russians are doing is absolutely appalling in Ukraine, it is part, I'm afraid, of a form of warfare which in its different ways, although in a very extreme form, um, is no less costly than you've seen, no more costly, in fact, less costly so far than you've seen in the war on terror. Now that I'm afraid is a reality. It may be very uncomfortable, but, and you know, it's not the sort of thing one normally says in public, but that is, that is where we are. Some other issues, which I think we'll want to look at. I've mentioned uh, Ukraine as a breadbasket. Ukraine is a very fertile country. It's a very good wheat, uh, well, basically cereal producer, oats, wheat, maize, and others. And it exports to many countries, particularly countries in the global south. Um, in fact, if you look at, say, just look at any aerial photograph of Odessa, you see at any one time in the port, the big grain ships loading up. They probably are not now, and the risk is they won't be for the next six months or so. This is the planting season in Ukraine. And if the crops aren't planted, they won't be harvested. And it's a major factor in world food security. So that has to be dealt with as well. But the trouble is under the general free market system, even if there's enough food to go around in the overall food reserve worldwide, particularly big, the big ones in, in the Midwest silos, then the, the food prices will go up through the roof. So we have that potential problem, which requires very strong action and support from many wealthy states if a food crisis does develop later this year. Another thing, obviously, is, you know, Henry V, Act II, Prologue, now thrive the armourers. This is an extraordinary good time to be an arms manufacturer, and we always tend to forget that. But believe me, whether you like it or not, there'll be a lot of money being made on this. And that is a facet of the world we live in. That means at the end, you know, you end up getting pretty depressed because we're not even beginning to talk about the effect this might have on climate change. But, and this is the other thing, the more people realize this is what's really happening, and even more so realize that whatever else we have, we have an extraordinary humanitarian disaster which needs help now, then that in a sense is the other side of the coin. And you look at what many countries in Western Europe are doing, look at the way the Germans are receiving refugees uh, in large numbers in Berlin and immediately finding places for them. That I think is absolutely, that at least is reassuring that the, the humanity is still around. And we, I think we have to recognize that. I wish I could say, could praise in any sense, the actions of the current British government, but you wouldn't expect me to do. And frankly, I think the, the action here has been absolutely appalling. But essentially, that is the kind of thing where we can at least have an effect on this. And at least in this terrible time, remind people repeatedly why refugees are refugees in the first place. And this applies right across the board. I think there is a possibility um, that the war may not last as long as we fear, because I think what may happen is the undermining within Russia of what they're doing, and almost certainly um, the role of China, which I think is going to change, it, or is re beginning already to change subtly. And that may mean that even Putin has to recognize that he not, cannot get his way. I was talking to a very experienced Russian commentator recently on this, and I, I said, well, look, Putin has more or less full control of the media. Suppose he could not achieve his objective and has to settle for less. Can he sell that to most Russians? And the person looked at me and said, yes, probably he can. And that's the extraordinary thing. It may be that Putin uh, will accept, will actually go for some sort of compromise in the belief, rightly or wrongly, that he can survive. Now that's more than a straw in the wind. In fact, I think it's quite possible that the way things are going. 
Beyond that, there are no easy ways forward, except, you know, the whole business of saying that the whole idea of wars is so crazy. You know, the old saying, if war is the answer, it's a stupid question. But I think we've got to go, we could do a huge amount to try and convince people of that, even in the midst of this conflict. Now, I've done about 35, 40 minutes, which I think quite long enough for everybody, anybody, and I hope it hasn't been too blunt in times. I'd be more than happy to sort of talk more about aspects of it or for people to talk about them by themselves. But for now, I think it's probably best to bring this part of the evening to the end and pass us back to, to Mills for what comes next. Thank you very much, Paul. And I'm going...